So it's really kind of keeping track of, it's usually very easy um, to upgrade to the next version as long as you're keeping track of, of updates. And so I do recommend having someone keep in mind that these are things you have to continually maintain. It's not a one, you installed Brahms, you've got it working, and then you're done forever. Well, no, because not only will Brahms upgrade, the operating system on your computer is going to upgrade, things are not going to start working together. So you have to keep in mind that when you create an electronic collection, everything has to be maintained over time, even after you've digitized all your specimens. This is our hardest one right now. We have two million specimens barcoded. So every time a new researcher comes into the herbarium and redetermines those two million, one of those two million specimens, or usually a whole um, set of them, we have to go back to the database first, especially when we have to refile them in a different location. The database still says they're filed under one name, and if someone's redetermined them, we can't put them in the herbarium under the new name until we've updated the database. And that adds, in, instead of taking 15 minutes to just move the specimens from one spot to another, we have to take 45 minutes to update all the database records and then move them. So that adds significant amount of time to staff that who are probably already overworked. And if you're dating, databasing specimens from a certain region, any new specimens that come in um, will also need to be databased. So we've finished, finished um, databasing our Brazilian specimens, or almost finished. Okay, that's great. But the funding for that is over. So what happens when new specimens come in from Brazil? If we don't database those as well, we're gonna start filing those specimens in, and we'll say we database them all, but we won't know anymore because all the new ones haven't been databased. So it is really hard to maintain these projects, uh, especially when you have a defining, def you know, a really strict definition of what the project is, location, Brazil, vascular plants, all databased. Um, unless we keep doing that, and the funding for that is over, so we have to find regular staff to actually try to keep these catalogs updated. And Kim will touch on this more, but images need to be archived, and that archive needs to be securely maintained into the future. So you've imaged your specimens, great, you've got them on two hard drives, but you have to keep checking that those hard drives aren't failing, you have to get new ones and continually shift and migrate them to the next platform. This is a very big part of digitization that you have to put into your workflow so that you, know, it's not, you realize and your administrators know it's not a one-time deal. Other things you're gonna wanna consider when you're developing this uh, workflow is sensitive data. How do you wanna deal with certain things? Um, I don't have the best answers for this. We've changed our policies on this a few times, but you need to decide for yourself should your institution supply specific locality information for endangered species. Um, Determining which species are endangered, you can use the Convention on International Trade uh, in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, the CITES Index. Uh, CITES has Appendix 1, 2, and 3 for different categories of being endangered. There's an International Union for Conservation of Nature, the IUCN Red List. Um, your country may have its own list of endangered species. Regions may have their own list of endangered species. Um, and what we used to do is we didn't image as many specimens as we do now. So back in the day, we used to blur locality information for endangered species. So for an endangered orchid, let's say, we would hide that information online. As we started imaging all of our specimens, that becomes massively tedious, time-consuming task. And so, and at the same time, all of our duplicates were being databased at other institutions. And they were putting the full locality information online. So we were spending all this time to hide all this information for endangered species, and other institutions were putting the exact duplicate online with no um, hiding of locality data. So it gets to be, you know, I think it's a judgment call, and I think it's everyone's responsibility to do what you think is best for your institution or the flora or the specific taxa you're working with. But it's something to keep in mind as you're databasing, because if you're putting information into a database, and if you need to keep certain parts of that information restricted, that's something, that's a policy you should set up front. GBIF has a guide to best practices as well you might want to read, um, and that's downloadable online. You've got this presentation in your, um, or you will get it fairly soon. 
Another piece of sensitive data you might want to think about is access to traditional knowledge. Uh, some specimen labels contain detailed use information and who's been doing that. And there's a, um, you may need to protect the species, um, the use of species by native cultures to prevent um, things being exploited for commercial use. If that is a fear uh, for parts of your collection, this is another thing you might want to consider when you're creating a policy um, up front so that you're not adding all this information to a database that's going to be made available and then you have to try to retract data. So just think about that now. So, when you start, whatever you're doing today, you will not be doing 10 years from now. But do the best you can to start and just accept the fact that technology is going to improve and things will change. In 1998 is when we started uh, imaging specimens. We, were, um, we bought the first digital SLR camera that was out. It was six megapixels. Um, most people's cell phones have better cameras in them now. It cost $25,000. We got a grant. It was massively expensive. We couldn't color ba balance that thing to save our lives. It was always red. Everything that came out of that camera was red. Um, the white balance, and it was never working right. You can see a, a hot spot in this corner. Uh, the lights were always hard to manage. They were always getting uh, janitors would mop the floors and hit the lights out of play whack and then we'd have all this unevenness. But that was the best we were doing and they were great. We put them all online. Um, but today we've completely changed and Kim will go over all the details of our imaging station tomorrow. But now we have these beautiful, um, well illuminated sheets with a scale bar and a color checker. We're now running using 21 megapixel cameras that only, and the whole digital station together combined cost $6,000. And so we've sort of gone, so we still have these images in our database and online, but we're, we're getting better. And so you're gonna have a combination of different types of technology if you're continuing a program over time. And one day you may even redo what you've already done. Uh, we started with our types in the, in the late 90s and we imaged 100,000 vascular plant types. Then the Global Plants Initiative started. Um, the Mellon Foundation came to us and said, well, we'll fund you to re-image your types with an herb scan because the quality is so much better. And we were like, oh, no way. Um, re-image? We just imaged 100,000 specimens. You, now you want us to re-image them? And so we thought about it for a little while, but if you look at the quality, and this was the best quality you possibly could get when we did it, um, and this is sort of a, the maximum re resolution for that section of it. If you look at it under a herb scanned image, you have much better resolution. So as technology changes, finally we accepted the fact that um, this is always, this is just part of digitization. You will not be doing um, five years from now what you're doing today. And that's good, that's great, because you'll just accept technology um, as it gets better. Now, um, we've been talking a lot about iDigBio, but we haven't really gone into sort of an explanation of what exactly it is. And iDigBio right now in the United States, it stands for Integrated Digitized Bio Collections. And it's the hub for a national effort in the United States to s provide support for digitizing collections of all disciplines and of all shapes and sizes. And so iDigBio.org has a, a tons of resources um, for digitizing specimens. It's being run out of the University of Florida and Florida State University. It provides a number of toolkits for getting started with digitizations, again, for all disciplines. I know I've been focusing on plants and I apologize for that, but that's pretty much all I know about. Uh, but this will help you get started for any sort of object you may want to digitize. All the workshop notes are online. It's also gonna, it also has a portal to collections data from U.S. institutions. It provides tools for educators. It encourages participation from citizen scientists. And there's a whole bunch of stuff today that we'll be we doing that they've actually created. And this is, again, a National Science Foundation effort in the US for the next 10 years. Well, probably the next seven years at this point. But it's a 10-year project to try to get US collections digitized. 
Here's a, an example of some of the workshops. You can find all of the um, documentation and uh, pr portal websites or project websites online. There's one on information technology standards, public participation, so more like crowdsourcing for digitizing biodiversity data. I talked yesterday about the augmenting OCR workshop. They taught a big georeferencing, train the trainers. Uh, John was a big one of, was one of those trainers. He actually then trained collections managers to do d digitization. Uh, Kim was one of those, and then Kim had her own workshop. So this is sort of how do we pass the knowledge around? Um, it's not just you can only have a trainer who's responsible for training everyone. If we pass, if we teach everyone how to do this, then each one of you can go out and teach everyone else that may want to learn these things. So they've been really great at. Uh, spreading the knowledge around to anyone who's looking for it. Uh, they do workshops on, on um, databases, so they did one on Specify 6. And then what we're going to go through next are the digitization of many collection types. Um, anywhere from paleo collections to um, things in jars, pinned insects, everything. Now, I, what we can look at more closely um, are the iDig Bio workflow analyses that they've done. So Gil Nelson and Deb Paul from iDig Bio went around to a number of institutions in the US and sat down with digitization staff. Um, they came to New York and we, they went to every single digitization project we do, because um, some of our projects still have different workflows, and wrote down everything. Um, turn on the camera, you know, find the specimens, do this. A, in a completely step-by-step -step procedure. And so they then summarized, after going to all those institutions and holding all these workshops, they then summarized every piece of information that came from all the institutions and put together sort of best practices and things that you can take, uh, take and then sort of see if you can adjust it to your institution. So uh, you'll be getting on today's USB drive a copy of all of these modules. Uh, one's for flat sheets and packets, another one is for pin things in trays and drawers, and things in spirits in jars. So it created lists of all tasks for each type of specimen that you may need to consider when you're designing your workflows. Uh, this will be in the iDig Bio workflows, modules, and task lists when you get your, um, the USB drives. Each one of these um, modules has a, also a wiki online that contains even more information, the discussions that took place in order to come up with the workflows, uh, and that can be found at this link. So for example, what does the flat sheets and packets working group um, workflows contain? The it contains seven modules. The seventh one I don't think has been published yet, but module one, what are the pre-digitization curation tasks? And that will walk you through a, a list of potential tasks. Module two is uh, an imaging station setup, um, and that'll wa walk you through all the possible tasks, and so on. So again, in, in Botany, we've done, uh, a lot of people were members of the Global Plants Initiative, and they have herb scans. So there's a setup for a scanner, and there's a setup for a camera. Then there's the specific tasks you do when you're imaging. And then there's imaging processing tasks, data capture tasks, and data enrichment tasks. And so by going through all these, you'll have a lot of options um, that may relate to your institution. And these workflows can scale to any size. They're, they're all going to be very general. And then you can use the workflows as a starting point to adapt to your institution. And what I really want to, to um, you know, a really good take home message in all this is there's no one way to correctly digitize specimens. Um, if you get things digitized in the best way you possibly can, that is the best way for you to do it. Um, don't let confusion over what to do prevent you from getting started because a lot of times people will say to us, well, I just don't know, this is better, I want, I want this, but I can only afford this, so maybe I should wait until we can pay for this. Um, I don't know, I, if you want to get started, I say get started with whatever you can. And the best thing you can do is just review everything that's out there, 